Um, we're going to study, and I think, Dan, Dan, did you do the agape phileo thing here, or was it in the old building? Here, how long ago? It was just three weeks ago a month. How many of y'all are here for Dan's agape versus phileo lesson? Okay, a few of you. Okay, good. Uh, we're going we're gonna to kind of recap that a little bit, but we're also going to go over some other stuff that I've talked about before in the past about why the Greek and people that use the Greek are um, just trying to impress you and, they don't, and there's really not any substance to it, okay? Um, I want you to t- take your Bibles and I want you to go to 1 Corinthians 2. I just want to kind of leap off this verse here, 1 Corinthians 2. First Corinthians chapter two. I right, look at First Corinthians chapter two, and uh, look there at verse number one. I love these verses for a plethora of reasons. Um, one, because these verses really show you um, Paul's modus of operation. Uh, it really kind of shows you um, how Paul uh, how Paul came about preaching and teaching. Notice what he says. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech, notice verse number four, my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the what? Power of God. Um, I want to preach to you on, on this thought, this little, this little lesson, whatever you, want, whatever you want to call it, teaching, preaching, on it's all Greek to me. It's all Greek to me. You ever heard that expression before? Somebody says something you don't understand. You say, man, all Greek to me. Well, I'm going to literally teach on. It's all Greek to me. Let's pray together. Father, we love you. Thank you, Lord, for letting us be uh, down in the basement again, Lord. It's better to have here than nowhere. And so, Lord, I pray that you bless our time as we study your book. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, this message is kind of birthed. I was watching, and I, I don't want to mention who I was watching, but I was watching an individual in this area a couple of weeks ago. And, um, and they were up there, they were not preaching out of a King James Bible, but they were, and they were preaching and teaching, and they were using Greek every other breath. And one of, the, of course, the most famous things with the Greek is uh, that a lot of guys like to use, is they like to use the agape verse phileo thing. In the Greek, not, now listen, before, let me just preface this message, and I'm sure the people on the internet will have a heyday with this. I don't know Greek. I don't speak Greek. I don't write Greek. I can't read Greek. I don't know Greek. So anything that I'm up here saying to you is just bare minimum, just stuff that I've studied throughout the years, but has nothing to do with me acting like I have a working knowledge of Greek. I don't know Greek. And nine times out of ten, the guys that get up and try to quote the Greek, guess what they don't know either? The Greek. They don't know it. Honestly, I hear these guys... I mean, bless their hearts. I'm not trying to be ugly, but I'll have these guys. They'll get up there. They can barely read the king's English, and yet they want me to believe that they know a, the definition of a Greek word. I, I don't believe it, man. So uh, there are three. Uh, so I'm just going to go through a list of things here. And, and by the way, I don't know if you've noticed. All right, some of you've been some of you've been with me since we started. Like Josh, he's been with me all nine years. Some of you just started coming within the past couple of weeks. All right, so I don't know if you notice, but um, nobody ever kind of has to guess what I'm trying to say when I'm preaching. All right? Uh, I'm very plain when I speak. I'm very plain when I talk. I don't use flowery words and flowery, flowery sentences. I don't try to get up here and impress you. I just lay all 52 cards face up on the table. And if you like it, great. If you don't, there's other churches. Amen. <laughs> That's just how it is. That's as simple as I know how to put it. Okay? I don't get up here and try to wow you with Greek definitions and with Hebrew definitions and root words and all that kind of stuff. I'm not going to do it. I I believe I have a perfect English Bible sitting right here that is sufficient to tell me everything I know and it's the final authority in all matters of faith and practice. So, So don't think I know Greek. I don't know Greek. 
See, I'm humble enough to tell you when I don't know something. I don't know Greek, okay? But I want you to notice, in the Greek, there are three different words for the word. People say, oh, well, that English Bible. You know, the, King, the English is just so insufficient to properly convey all the truth and the depth of the Greek language. They have a, they, they have a Greek word for that. It's called balogna, amen? <laughs> the, the Greek word for that is balogna. That's a bunch of baloney, man. Uh, the English language is perfectly su- to sufficient to convey all the truth that God wants us to know. I'm going to give you an example where this, where all, oh, this is, this is the best one. This is the one they love to use. Well, you know, in the Greek, there are three words for love. And that's true. There are three words for love. There is eros, if I'm getting these, if, if the spellings are not exactly correct, you know, forgive me, okay? Anyway, Eros, this is a sensual love. This is like a lust love, for example. Uh, this is where we get the word erotic from, okay? This is never used in the, in, the, in the New Testament text, this word love, but it is a word for love. Then there is phileo. This means brotherly love. This is kind of like a quote-unquote casual brotherly love, uh, a love that you would have for a friend or something like that. Uh, or the brethren. In fact, Philadelphia, Phila, Phileo, this is where we get the word love. Like if you, if you, and you can, of course, like uh, you can attach that to different things. Um, uh, pedophilia is the, the word technically is pedo meaning young or child, child love. All right, necrophilia, necro meaning dead, a love of dead people. And it, all these you know, sins and horrible things that you connect with it, none of them being love, right? None of them love, but they've attached that philia for philio onto it, okay? But phileo in the Greek is brotherly love. Then there is the agape love. Ooh, did you feel the power of God all over that word agape? And this is like a godly, selfless love. This is like... You know, uh, the love that, that Jesus Christ showed on the cross and the love that, that Je- you know, all that kind of stuff. This is the, and I've heard preachers get up and talk about this stuff. Okay, so Dan did it a couple of weeks ago, so I'm not going to go over it, you know, wholeheartedly and go over everything. But I'm just going to show you how the, this idea and, and, and God, I've literally heard people say, for God to love the world. That word love there is agape love. God so agape you. He did what? He agape you so much. You know, that kind of thing. All right, well, I'm, we're just going to go over, and uh, I'm just going to give you a few things. You tell me if this sounds like agape or phileo. All right, uh, all right here we go. Um, now, Jesus loved Martha her, uh, and her sister and Lazarus. Is that agape or phileo? It's, a, it's actually agape. It's agape. He, Christ had a, a selfless love for her. All right, but hold on a second. Then she runneth and cometh to Simon, Peter, and the other disciple whom Jesus loved. Agape or phileo? It's phileo. All right. Um, How about this one? Let's see here. But God commendeth his love toward sinners, and that while we were yet, or God commended his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's agape. All right. So, So the definitions sometimes seem to match up. Okay, um, let's see here. Uh, hey, let me find one here. All right, uh, young women to uh, teach the young women to be sober, to love their own husbands. Agape or phileo? It's phileo there. That's the Greek word phileo. All right. So ought men to love their wives as their own body. Agape or phileo? It's agape. Well, now, why are wives told to love with phileo love, but husbands are told to love with agape love? I guess women don't have to love the men the same way the women do. Or vice versa, however, however that goes. All right, hold on a second. Love the brotherhood. Agape or phileo? Love the brotherhood. It's agape. It's not even phileo. See how that thing, it, it just, it just, it, it never ends. All right, how about this one? 
But after that, the kindness and love of God, our Savior, toward man appeared. Agape or phileo? It's phileo in the Greek. Okay? Um, But whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Agape or phileo? Phileo? It's agape. See? You can't make heads or tails of it. And this one's not in here, but you know where it talks about the... If I'm getting this, if I'm remembering this correctly, you know where it says the Pharisees love to have the uppermost seats? It's a cafe. <laughs> <laughs> the Pharisees love to have the uppermost seats. That's, that's a godly, selfless love. They like to have the uppermost seats. See, you can't make sense of it. All right? The whole gape, phileo thing, just is... It's, it's, it, it's just... It's false. It's fluff. It, it's not real. Okay? But you got a bunch of preachers that'll get up and try to tell you that all that stuff is real and you got to know the Greek to figure out which love it really is and all that kind of stuff. It's false. Okay. How about this one? You ready for another one? It's all Greek to me. All right. Uh, take your Bibles and look at, look at uh, 2 Corinthians 13.5. Look at 2 Corinthians 13.5. Second Corinthians thirteen five. Somebody, somebody, read it to me. Examine yourselves whether you be in faith. Prove your own selves. Know you're not your own selves. How that Jesus Christ is in you, except you be reprobate. Okay. So if Jesus Christ is not in you, what are you? You're a reprobate. Okay, you're a reprobate. Now that does not mean like John Calvin teaches that that's somebody beyond the hope of salvation. All right, but the word reprobate is used there. It's a lost person. If you're not saved, you're a reprobate. All right, the reprobate mind, all that kind of stuff. All right, I believe it's, uh, I believe reprobate and reprobates, I believe in all of its entirety. If I'm getting this correct, I'm doing this off of memory. You have to forgive me. I believe it's used eight times. All eight times the word reprobate is mentioned. It all comes from the same Greek word. The Greek word is adokimos, adokimos, okay? This Greek word literally means unapproved. I asked my, I have an uncle, my my mother's sister married a guy from Thessalonica. They call it Saloniki over there. And I literally asked him, what does adokimos mean? He goes, it it basically means to like... uh, to not pass a test, like to fail a test. It's unapproved. You didn't get, you didn't get approved. He said it, it has, also has the meaning of like if something is in a sentence is grammatically incorrect. Okay? So, this word means unapproved. Let me show you a little lesson here. You've heard me talk about this before. Dokimos means approved. But if you add the A in front of it, it makes it a negative. So it's unapproved. Okay, a theist is someone who believes in God. An atheist is somebody who doesn't believe in God. Gnostic, the Greek word gnostic or uh, epinosos or however you say it. See, I don't know Greek, I don't know. All right, but the word gnostic means knowledge, you know. But an agnostic is somebody that doesn't know if there's a God, right? So that A makes it negative. Now stay with me here. Eight times this Greek word is translated reprobate. What is a reprobate? Someone that does not have Jesus Christ in them. All right, now go to 1 Corinthians 9. Go to 1 Corinthians 9. 1 Look at 1 Corinthians 9. And look at verse 27. All right, 1 Corinthians 9. Look there at verse number 27. All right, somebody read me 1 Corinthians 9, 27. But I keep under my body and bring it unto subjection, into subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. That word castaway there, you see that word castaway? Is that the same word? Is that the word reprobate? Not a trick, it's not a trick question. Is that the same word as reprobate? In the English, no. Because is Paul a reprobate? Now, he said in 2 Corinthians 13, he, he could appear as a reprobate, right? 
but he wasn't a reprobate. He said, but I trust you know that we are not reprobates, though we be as reprobates. Kind of a little bit like what I was talking about this morning, right? We can all act lost, but we're not lost, right? Okay, but hold on a second. Guess what Greek word this is here? It's a dokimos. See, if you had the Greek, and you know the Catholic Church literally uses that, 1 Corinthians 9, 27, the Catholic Church literally uses that to teach that a man can lose his salvation and become a reprobate after he's been saved. Because it's the same Greek. Paul said, well, Paul said he, he had a fear of a dokimos. And remember, that same Greek word is translated reprobate. And a reprobate is somebody that doesn't have Jesus in them. All right, well, hold on a second. Time out. We don't believe a man can lose his salvation, do we? Nor is that what the King James Bible teaches. Paul said he could be like a castaway. Not a reprobate. See the difference? But if you, just, if you go back to the Greek, you can make the Bible teach a man's losing his salvation. Make it, make it seem like Paul's teaching that. Better be careful. All right, how about this one? You've heard me talk about this one. Let's just, let's just kind of hit on this one and then go right back, go right back to another one because I've already talked about this one. Uh, first, or excuse me, Romans chapter 16. Romans chapter 16. You've heard me talk about this one. I've hit on it before, so we'll just we'll just skim on it and go and, and keep plowing along. First Corinthians chapter six, or excuse me, Romans chapter sixteen, verse number one. Phoebe is a what? What is Phoebe? A servant of the church. Are there any such thing as women deacons? No. As long as I'm the pastor here, there never will be a woman deacon. It's just it's unbiblical. It's strictly unbiblical. All right, well, but, but, but preacher of the Bible talks about deaconesses. Never one time does the King James Bible ever use the word deaconess. Now, let me show you something. Where do they get the idea of women deacons from, though? They get it from that Greek word. See where it says that Phoebe was a servant of the church? That's the same Greek word, diokinesa, feminine. That word is translated masculine as deacon, in first, uh, in first Timothy chapter three, now, nothing like the English to clear up the Greek text. Why couldn't she be? Why couldn't she be a deaconess? Well, according to First Timothy chapter three, you have to be the husband of one wife to be a deacon. Well, yeah, don't worry. She, she's got a wife. Okay, now we got a whole other problem. Now she's a lesbian. Right? Well, that's a problem. So, I mean, which one is it? All right. But see, you have to have the English. The King James translators knew enough about the Bible and knew enough about 1 Timothy 3 that that word de uh, diokinesa there, they didn't translate that as deaconess. They translated that as servant. Nothing like the English to clear up the vague Greek. I just wish the Greek was sufficient enough to explain what God really meant. Now, I'm being facetious there. Obviously, the originals were written in Greek. I'm being facetious. But see, they'll say this kind of stuff, they'll say this kind of stuff about, the, about the English all the time, but fail to tell you this kind of stuff about the Greek. Now, how about this one? Look at, look at, look at uh, Acts chapter 12. Look at Acts chapter 12. We're going to look at one of the most, mis, we're going to look at one of the most unfortunate tra mistranslations in the King James Bible. One of the just most, just, oh, it is so, it is so unfortunate how the translators got this one wrong. Of course, I say that tongue-in-cheek. All right. Y'all remember this past Easter when I did the lesson on the word Easter? The word Easter appears in your King James Bible one time. And I heard all my life growing up, well, Easter is referring to the pagan holiday of what? Ishtar. Only problem is, as I got to studying that, about a year and a half ago, and I found out I just wasn't right. It just wasn't right. Easter. The word Easter there. Now watch this. The Greek word is Pasqua. This word is used 29 times in the Greek New Testament, and 28 times it is translated as what? Passover. And then this one random time, the 
King James translators decided in Acts 12.4 to put what word? Easter. Was it talking about Passover? Is it talking about Ishtar? And there's all these different scenarios and all these different Bible believers have their own opinion. But I'm, I'm pretty, pretty dogmatic about the fact that Easter is not referring to Ishtar at all. It's not referring to a pagan holiday. We studied it out, and I did the whole lesson this past Easter. What is Easter more than likely referring to? The rising of Jesus Christ, the resurrection of Jesus Christ in connection to the Passover. Referring to the resurrection. Earlier English translations, such as the Tyndale Bible, you know what they used for Pascua several times? Anybody know? Does anybody know what Tyndale called Christ in 1 Corinthians 5, 7? Nope, the King James calls him the Passover lamb, but the Tyndale Bible, you know what the Tyndale Bible calls him? Calls him the Easter lamb. Now, the King James translators had it right, but the word Easter was not used as a pagan holiday. They did not think it was a pagan holiday back in those days. The King James translators would have never used the word Easter. Easter has been around since they have documentation all the way back to eight, the 800s about English-speaking people calling it Easter. And it was also... Where did English come from? What language did English come from? German. German. Do you know what the English... You know what the, the German word for Easter is? Oster. Oster. You know what Oster is? Ostern means to rise from the east. Oster, what, what's our word? East, eastern. You know, we already we talked about it, and I don't want to recap that whole lesson, but where did, where did Jesus Christ, what is the, the he's called the, the morning star, the bright morning star. Where does the morning star rise from? The east. So Easter, I, I don't think it's a pagan term. I used to think it was a pagan term. Now, don't get me wrong, we don't, we're not going to do Easter bunnies. We're not going to bring in here and dye Easter eggs and all that kind of, you know, pagan stuff. But understand that, that Easter, I don't think it means Ishtar. I think it means Easter. I mean, I think it means the rising of Jesus Christ. Because notice, every other time it's referring to Passover. There's only one mention of the Greek word Pasqua that happened after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Anybody know where that's found? Acts 12, 4, where it uses the word Easter. Easter is referring to Passover, but not just Passover. It's referring to the post-resurrected Christ Passover. Does that make sense? Okay. I hope I'm not losing some of you. All right, let's look at another one. Let's look at another one. I like this. This one's hilarious. To me, this one's funny. All right. Uh, look, at, look at Mark chapter 7. Look at Mark chapter 7. This one's funny to me. Now, are we Baptist? All right, good. We're Baptist, right? All right, look at Mark chapter 7. All right, look at Mark chapter number 7. Now, what does Baptist... Does anybody know where the word Baptist comes from? Baptizo. I think... If I'm getting this correctly, again, the spelling, don't hold me to the spelling. B-A-P-T-I-Z-O. I think that's how it goes in the Greek. Again, it's all Greek to me. Amen. But baptizo. What does this word mean? To immerse. Basically, to immerse. To dip. Immerse. Uh, some people even go, you know, say it's to dunk. There was even a group of people back in the day, they were called the dunkards. Not the drunkards, the dunkards. It means to dunk. It, we, we believe in baptism by what? Immersion. You got to get your whole body in the water. We don't believe in baptism by aspersion, where we sprinkle it. We don't believe in baptism by effusion, where we pour it. We believe in baptism by immersion. You get in the water and you get dunked, Right? That's where we get the word Baptist. This is a Greek word. So the Greek word to, or the English word baptize, this is what we call a transliterated word. It's a tra it basically, you just take the Greek form and English, Englishize it. 
Is that a word? It is now. Anglicize it, whatever, however you want to call it. All right. It, this is what this is called transliteration. Transliteration. You just take the you just take one word from one language and you just transliterate it over. Okay? Now stay with me here. You ready? To me, this one cracks me up. Like this is hilarious. The how how ignorant uh, Greek scholars can be just of practical. See, you can get so educated you become stupid. You realize that? I mean, you can be you can be you can be so educated you're stupid. Let me show you something here. You ready? Mark chapter number seven. And look at what it says there in verse number uh, 1. Then came together unto him the Pharisees and certain of the scribes which came from Jerusalem. And when they saw some of his disciples eat bread with with defiled, that is to say with unwashing uh, hands, they found fault. For the Pharisees and all their Jews, except they, and all the Jews, except they wash their hands oft, eat not, holding the tradition of the elders. By the way, uh, that means that if you make somebody wash their hands before they eat, mamas, uh, you are violating their conscience, and their liberty in Jesus Christ. I'm teasing. I'm being facetious there. All right. But notice what it says in verse number 4. And when they come from the market, except they wash, they eat not. And many other things there be which they have received to hold as the washing of cups and pots, brazen vessels. Now, hold on a second. You know what that word wash means? You know what, you know what Greek word that word wash is there? It's baptizo. Well, preacher, what's the big deal about that? I mean, some of you ladies, if you wash your, you wash your pots or whatever, your cups, if you don't have a dishwasher, you fill up the sink and you wash it and you get it down in there and you, wash, you baptize them, right? No problem there. Hold on a second. What's the last two words that I left off of that verse? And tables. <laughs> you think these Jewish women were taking their, taking their tables out into the Jordan River and dunking them completely under to wash them? No. Do you think, these ladies, you think they had big old pools in there and those ladies were saying, you know, dunking those tables down? At, no. What were they doing? They were getting a rag and just washing the top off. But that Greek word there is baptizo. See, that's why you've got to be careful with the Greek. Oh, man, these Jews were so holy, they were, they were baptizing their tables. That's easy to believe with a pot or a cup or a plate, but it's a little bit harder to believe when you're talking about a table. I mean, what if, what if I started telling you, all right, ladies, every time we have an eat, and I need y'all to take these tables, go down on the French broad and dunk them. Dunk every one of them. That's the only way they're going to get clean. Dunk them under the water. It's ridiculous, right? It's ridiculous. But that's what you get when you follow the Greek. Can it mean wash? Yes. Can it mean fully immerse? Yes. See, you can, here's the thing. You can make the Bible teach anything you want to by going back to the Greek, right? You got to be careful. You got to be careful. All right, how about this one? Take your Bibles and look at 1 Timothy chapter 3. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 3. We'll do this one, then we'll, be, we'll get out of here. Look at 1 Timothy chapter number 3. Look there at verse number 1. 1 Timothy chapter 3, look there at verse number 1. Uh, how does it start off? If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good thing. Is that right? Did I get that? Huh? A good work. Good work. All right, look at verse number 2. What is it? Somebody read it to me. The bishop must be a blameless, the husband of one wife. Must be blameless, the husband of one wife. Now, I forget what the Greek word there is for one there. Um, I'm trying to remember the life of me. I can't remember it, and I don't have it written down my notes. Okay. Huh? Uno, no, that, that's Spanish. All right, but the Greek word, Greek there. Now, we understand that the husband of one wife must be present tense husband of one wife. All right, that means, and I've always taught this, biblically speaking, if I, if my wife, there's three biblical reasons a divorce ends. Three biblical reasons. What are those three reasons? Abandonment, fornication, not adultery. If my wife goes out and cheats on me with, and, and, and lays with another man, I'm li- biblically, I am free to remarry another woman. That's, first, or that's uh, Matthew 19, 9. And then what's the other one? Death. Those are the three biblical reasons a marriage dissolves. If, you're, if your spouse completely abandons you, if they physically cheat on you, or if they die. 
That's the only three reasons a marriage biblically dissolves. Now, hold on and stay with me here. Uh, you've got these people now that teach, you know, the past couple of decades, there's been the, these group of Baptists that say, well, if a man's been divorced... Now, by the way, I'm not divorced, okay? I'm not divorced. I, I've been happily married for 13 years. My wife's been happily married about nine of them, I think, okay? Anyway, all right. Is she... Is she, is she out? Oh, she's not even in here. She's gone. Huh? Oh, she had a, okay, she had a call. That must have been her boyfriend calling. No, I'm kidding. All right. <laughs> she's not in here, so I have courage. She's back. Oh, she's back. Hey, I was just telling everybody how beautiful you were, love. <laughs> now, watch this. If my wife goes out and cheats on me, and, and, I mean, God forbid, but she goes out and cheats on me, guess what I can do? I can biblically divorce her, remarry, and guess how many wives I've, guess how many wives I have? I have one. No, 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 you've had two wives. The Bible says you've got to be the husband of one wife. Hold on a second. A bishop must be the husband of one wife. I <laughs> See, watch this. If I have one wife and then I don't have a wife, how many, is that, how many wives is that equal? And then, and, then, and then I marry another wife. How many is that? Well, according to all the fundamentalists and all the independent Baptists, that equals two. Only in an independent Baptist church do you get that kind of math. That man has been divorced and remarried, can still preach and still pastor and still be a deacon. As long as he got divorced for the a biblical reason. If he goes out and cheats on his wife and gets remarried, he can still preach, but he can't be a pastor and he can't be a deacon. All right? So, now watch this. But you know what the Greek word there? Now, I could, I could go through In fact, I, hold, I read a whole writ. That's good hillbilly language, isn't it? I wrote a whole book about divorce and remarriage. Wrote a whole book about it. But if you look at the Greek word there for the husband of one wife, you know what that Greek word is? It's the Greek word for one, but it's an emphatic. It's like one with an exclamation point after it. And I had some of those guys when I wrote my book on divorce and remarriage, they said, well, don't you know what the Greek says? Sure don't. Nope, don't know at all what it's, the Greek says. Well, it's, 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 the, it's the word for one. It's emphatic. It's like one, like only one. Literally, the Greek says that? Yeah, that's what the Greek implies. Oh, it's what the Greek says or what the Greek implies. See how that thing gets twisted around? Well, I can make the Bible imply anything I want it to imply. Well, it, it's, it's one emphatic. It's like one exclamation point. Okay, well, guess what? My King James Bible says that a man can be... A, his, the marriage can be dissolved for three biblical reasons. If that's the case, and I had one of these old birds, I'll tell you this and we'll leave. We'll get out of here. I had one of these old birds. Evidently, he broke fellowship with me. Oh, no. Yes. Uh, I'd asked one of his preacher boys to come preach for me, this guy here in the area. And I, 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 one of his preacher boys was asking me a bunch of Bible questions. I say preacher boy, like we're literally the same age, but we were just, he wasn't pastoring, whatever. And, uh, and so he's asking me a bunch of Bible questions over text message. And we're just going back and forth for a couple of weeks. Just he's asking me different Bible questions. And I said, hey, man, why don't you come preach for me? I never heard anything from him. He never texted me back. That's weird. So a couple of days later, he texts me back and he says, hey, uh, I just want to let you know that because of your stance on divorce and remarried preachers, I don't biblically, I, I, my pastor and me, I just don't feel like I can preach for you because you allow divorced guys to preach behind your pulpit. Now, again, I'm not divorced, but I allow divorced guys to preach for me. And um, anyway, I sent him a text message back telling him exactly how I felt about that. And then I called his pastor. He said, hello. And I said, hey, man, I said, uh, I just got an interesting text message from one of your preacher boys uh, about y'all breaking fellowship with me because of divorce and remarriage. He goes, oh, yeah, well, I broke fellowship with you over about a year and a half ago. And I said, were you ever planning on telling me? <laughs> And, of course, the answer was no. He wasn't planning on telling me. And so, I, we, so, and I, so we, we, we got into it. Not like yelling and arguing, but I, we, we, I said, well, let's talk about this. And he said, well, you know, uh, I understand what you mean by the fact, you know, that you know, a marriage being dissolved for, uh, you know, because of a fornication and abandonment. I understand, but I just don't think a guy like that can still pastor. I said, okay. I said, well... Uh, do you believe that a man that's had his wife die and gets remarried, can he still pastor? Uh, well, 
because see, all those guys think if your wife dies, that's okay. And I said, but the Bible never differentiates here. He said, well, I, 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 yeah, I don't, I don't, yeah, if, if, a, if a guy's wife dies, he can't pastor anymore. <laughs> All right, I'm going to hold you to it. Well, guess what this guy did? This guy has had guys in his pulpit whose wife have died and they're still pastoring because that argument doesn't hold any water. It's one emphatic. Okay, well, if it's one emphatic, as the Greek says, then make sure that if somebody, if their wife dies of cancer and they get remarried, make sure you tell that person that they can't preach behind a pulpit because the Greek says it's only one. Do you see the twisted mess you get into when you, simply, when you don't simply just trust what God wrote in the book? You get into a horrible mess. And that's why you're never going to hear me up here spitting out the Greek. You're never going to hear me spitting out the Hebrew. And you're probably never going to hear any preacher I ever bring in do that either. And if they do do it, you'll probably never have to worry about listening to them do it ever again. At least behind this pulpit. It's just not going to happen. All right? And it all goes back to men... Try, as we read in 1 Corinthians 2, it all goes back to men trying to impress you with their own wisdom, with enticing words, making you feel like they're on some more intellectual level than they actually are. And you know why guys like that hate guys like me? I mean, they, they could probably name a few reasons. But you know the main reason why guys like that hate guys like me? Because when they try to impress everybody with their deceits, and when they get into a room with guys like me and guys like you and Bible believers, and they, they, when these fake Bible believers get around real Bible believers, it exposes them for what they really are. And that's why they hate preachers like me. A real Bible believer has liberty. Yes. Where the, they don't have. That's exactly right. Envious of your liberty, like the Pharisees were envious of Christ. That envy will drive them to a hatred, and they will try to destroy your reputation. They can't, they're, they're not allowed to murder you because that's against what the commandment. So in a very self-righteous way, they'll they try to expose faulty witness. It, I'm sorry, but that's... That's okay, Brother Bob. Yeah, they, they can't kill you physically. They'll try to assassinate your character. And boy, we'd be here for the rest of the day if I told you everything that people have tried to do to assassinate my character. But here I am, and I'm okay, right? Amen, amen, amen. All right, well, there it is. It's all Greek to me. Trust your English Bible. It is perfect and infallible. Let's pray we'll get out of here.